Today's Tuesday, May? May, yeah. 23rd. Jesus, where does the time go? <laughs> <laughs> we we usually try to do a joke for the intro, but we had a ton of stuff to do today, and we just can't come up with one. So, so once again, we're the joke. Yeah, we kind of always are, but this week we have to be more of a joke. <laughs> Especially so. Just kind of a follow-up from last week. Uh, the net neutrality is... Net neutrality. <laughs> net neutrality is going down in flames, as this Ars Technica article would have us believe, because Ajit Pai is like, yeah, we're going to start repealing this. Uh, we're not taking comments anymore. We're going we're gonna to do away with these Title II regulations. So there was a vote. It went exactly as everybody in the universe expected it to, and the answer is no more net neutrality. So I, The most surprising thing that came out of this for me, honestly, was the Jeep Pie was reading the mean tweets sarcastically. Oh, did you watch that video, though? Yeah. The man has no personality. I mean, it was like, you could tell somebody wrote those jokes for him, but he could not deliver them. <laughs> I was like, I already hate you, but now I feel kind of sorry for you because you're just, you're so, you're such a non-person. And this, coming from us, really <laughs> should say something. <laughs> Uh, there is another vote later this year, but unless uh, there's some sort of miracle <laughs> and the, the sun stops burning, maybe, <laughs> it's going to be no net neutrality. Yeah, it's going to be no net neutrality because yeah. and it's like, oh, we need a light touch for regulations. Like you had, Verizon had a light touch for regulations and they Comcast and Verizon were dicking around with the internet traffic, which is how we got Title II in the first place. So, I mean, come on. Also, in a follow-up is the group link to the NSA leaks that we've been talking about for the last, seems like forever, has another trove of leaks that are is on the precipice of release, or so they say, or is it some <laughs> sort of shell game? Now, this is not just another release. This is the, <laughs> the Shadow Brokers. So, just a quick recap. NSA had the tool that led to the ransomware. I think it was a couple of tools that they comboed together. Shadow Brokers stole it from the NSA, released it publicly, then everybody had it, and it was used for the ransom attack. So Shadow Brokers, they're in the middle there. Now they've promised monthly. It's almost going to be like a subscription plan. <laughs> if you want the hottest new hacks, the you know zero day, the good stuff, then you can give them money and they will sell it to you. So this is interesting. We mentioned this because this is going to go one of two ways. One, the intelligence communities have to reset back to zero. That means they're going to have to get with Microsoft, Cisco, and other major players and say... These are all the vulnerabilities that we have. You guys need to fix these. That would be the responsible thing to do. When we see that that doesn't happen in the next few months, remember who said what here first or whatever. <laughs> when you say it, it, does, it has to go one of two ways, you realize that's not the way it's going to go, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be the internet apocalypse, probably. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably fine. Also, kind of a follow up Apple uh, is lobbying against your right to repair iPhones. Now, this was suspected. But it's really hard to find lobbying records in New York State, but somebody had the foresight to do a freedom of information request. And this article documents exactly what has gone down. It was really surprising, to be honest. Yeah, we, so we knew this from some other leaks about Apple. And Apple, they're kind of, they don't really care. They're like, yeah, we're, this is us. This is what we do. We get, but this uh, Toyota was a surprising one. Makes sense, right? Yep. They don't, want you to, they don't want you to fix your own car. Caterpillar, of course, we had that story about John Deere and the Ukrainian hackers. <laughs> so Caterpillar, they don't want you fixing your own bulldozer or Dump whatever. Truck. Yeah, uh, and a, a variety of companies. So there are a lot of companies out there, and this Freedom of Information from New York proves they are all lobbying hard against right to repair. Now there was a like a nonprofit or a coalition or something for for the right to repair. They managed to only contribute about five thousand dollars. It's hard to. When your average person isn't repairing, yeah. it's a small community. But here's the thing about it. That small community can open up a shop that will then repair your stuff for cheaper when, and rather than have it be replaced. So actually supporting it will help you, even if you're not a repairer. <laughs> Isn't what government is about is about supporting the public good? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we've become so cynical. Uh, uh, but at that, least the... What, so, so, right. Now, the this story is about Stingray, you know, the cell thing. And that's an anti-terrorist tool, right? Well, we, 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 we use that now. The thing about Stingray is it's very invasive because it catches everybody, right? 
But the thing about it is, they only use it for terrorism. So it's only when it's a really dangerous, super active, important, or like an active shooter or something like that. They would never use it for something simple, right? One would think. I mean, that's what they what they've been saying. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, oh. no. Oh, oh, an undocumented worker. Were you <laughs> using stingrays to find the guy that works? At a Home Depot? Are you saying that this guy was milking cows <laughs> without U.S. citizenship? <laughs> well, let's invade everybody's privacy. <laughs> oh. Uh, how, how long before stingrays are deployed in, like, sanctuary cities? I mean, they could scoop up thousands and thousands of undocumented immigrants there. Well, I'll tell you how long. However, how long it takes for sanctuary cities to become a thing. <laughs> so this was ICE. ICE has stingrays and the, the new thing. It's got a new name now. they got, like, a more advanced version. But it's the same thing. It pretends to be a cell tower and collects all your data. And they used it to catch an illegal immigrant. I mean, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you stand on the illegal immigration. Let's not open that, that can of worms. But do you really, I mean, this is like hunting squirrels with a howitzer. You, we don't need that. There are better ways to find illegal immigrants than to steal everybody's phone data. <laughs> and we really don't need the collateral damage of that howitzer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing left of the squirrel at that point. <laughs> I guess I mean I mean the argument the only argument that I could come up with to to like that's even remotely as I guess they're saying is if you don't realize you've been harmed you've not been harmed and I just I don't it's like the repercussions of that can come out later kind of like asbestos it's like <laughs> ah you know it, just, it smells good it smells great and then 30 years later it's like welcome to mesothelioma well but also it's like it's a, it's stepping stones when do we get to the point where it's like they're using this for traffic tickets or something like that you know it's like wow it's tracking down alimony payments that's next. yeah yeah it's something that it's this is a really serious thing this is someone pretending to be your phone service and intercepting your calls and texts and whatever whatever it is it works because it sends it through this thing yeah. and so do you, let's say it doesn't have to be you Let's say someone in your office might be an illegal immigrant or some, you know, where you work or where you live. You live in an apartment building. Do you want all of your stuff intercepted because they're looking for somebody near you? God, it would be great if we had an undocumented worker to do the benchmarks for us. <laughs> <laughs> As it stands, I think we're going to skip that stage and go directly to robot, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, security vulnerability this week. Uh, on your firewall, you're going to want to block outbound SMB requests for Windows because... If you've got Google Chrome where you can download a file without actually, uh, you know, having to click on anything, um, you can download a file that Windows will automatically try to preload using an SMB connection, which means it's going to send your username and your domain and your hashed password to a remote party. Now, you might be thinking, I would never be stupid enough to click on a file that I don't recognize. Well, you don't actually have to. All you have to do is open in Windows Explorer the download the folder where this file is which is your download folder yeah so yeah. once it grabs it and you download a cat picture and you open in your show folder to look at your cat picture it's done this really needs to be fixed in chrome nightly but i think is actually more of a problem with windows mm -hmm. because windows is scanning your folders for certain kinds of files and it's like oh this is a shortcut file or this is you know not really a shortcut file this is you know whatever but it's a network connection that somebody may click on. Let me go ahead and see if I can establish a connection because historically that is a glacial process in Windows. Right. So I would assume that Microsoft will do something about this considering this is a major, major flaw. <laughs> yeah, but, like don't, don't do that in certain folders like download folders. What were you thinking? Or I think, I think I would just go ahead and I would wait. It's like, okay, I'm willing to wait for that <laughs> SMB connection rather than you preloading everything. I think Chrome should block download extensions for file types that uh, that do that kind of thing. I'm sure that there's more than one, probably like, you know, VBS, BAT, COM, mm. uh, SCR. I you I don't it's it's hard for me to imagine a legitimate scenario where somebody is still downloading cat screensavers from the internet using now, Chrome. You can go into Chrome and change that setting so that it never downloads automatically, which you probably should do. So, that's your first step, but this is, you know, who's going to do that? Most people aren't going to do that. You're going to forget to do that. You're going to do a fresh install, and then you're not going to forget it. So, <laughs> Secure yeah. by default. That's, that's what we got to opt for. How much would you expect to pay for a facial recognition check-in luggage kiosk at your nearest airport? <laughs> <laughs> I would expect it to be a lot. Actually, I'm one of those people who is willing to pay more for not having to deal with humans. <laughs> 
Well, Delta uh, paid like six hundred thousand dollars for four check-in kiosks that use face recognition to let you tag your own luggage. This is, of course, I guess we call this the robot story of the week, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a robot. We'll call him Baggy. <laughs> <laughs> And I think this is great. This is just like the fast food thing. It's going to remove human error. It's going to make things faster. And it's going to be able to racially profile you immediately. <laughs> Even before you board the plane. Exactly. United's yeah. going to love this. Uh. <laughs> I don't know. So I guess Delta has to maintain a copy of your facial features on It's file. the passport. Okay. So, so you have to match your passport within so many pixels. Huh. So... If you've gone through a major change physically, this isn't going to work for you. <laughs> I wouldn't think that there would be enough pixel data in your passport to do that reliably. This would be a good way to test if you're thinking like, hmm, how do I avoid the face scanners versus my picture that's online? Let me just, you know, buy some plane tickets and I get to go and <laughs> test. And it's like, ah, I got flagged for human screening. Perfect. <laughs> Delta did go out of their way to say that they don't maintain any like reversible information, meaning that they could go from the points on your face to like a picture of your face or something like that. But I mean, honestly, that's not audible. There's no way to like double check that claim. <laughs> they would never lie. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's just it's just not even a thing. <laughs> now that's the robot story. The two things we always have to have, right? A robot story and an Uber story. <laughs> Well, Uber has gone fully capitalistic, meaning that they're going to charge people what they think you're willing to pay, regardless of what it's worth. Now, this is the old machine learning. Ah, <laughs> uh, machine learning. It's the forces of good, right? Well, Uber's using it to look at where you started your trip from, what your history is, things about you that it knows in your advertising profile. And if it thinks you're a rich person, it's going to charge you a little bit more. Yeah, machine learning being used to squeeze people to have tiered pricing. Wow. <laughs> there, I mean, that, that is a microcosm of the machine learning future. I mean, with Bernays, we had, hey, we can do subtle psychological manipulation to help people sell products rather than selling products on merit. And now it is going to be, we have a robot that is gaslighting you 24-7 into buying <laughs> products. <laughs> now, the other thing about this, that doesn't pass the extra money along to the driver. That and so the driver's still getting paid like on the old system of mileage and stuff, whereas the use the passenger is paying more, but all that money's going directly to Uber. Well, if people complain enough, the extra money will go to the driver. I mean that worked yeah. for the banking and, and Wall Street uh, you know industries just fine. It's like I I'm really upset with what Bank of America is doing, but I've got some of their stock, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> They, uh, they insist that this is the only way they can remain competitive because it's such a doggy dog world in the, the cab service industry. So they're, they're not ashamed of it. They, they readily admit, yes, we're doing this and we have to. <laughs> huh. Isn't that interesting? Machine learning. <laughs> who, knew, who, who knew the companies would abuse machine learning? <laughs> <laughs> they would turn it to evil, weaponize it, as it were. <laughs> Couldn't see that coming. <laughs> Speaking of weaponizing things, we, we've also got weaponized politicians in this week's episode. Theresa May is creating a new internet, and I, I just don't even know what's going on over there. Jesus, what? What's? Can, can somebody fill us in? I don't even know what's going on. So we talked about this last week, and this is sort of, uh, she's really hitting this on her campaign trail. Part of her election thing is, or her election campaign is, we are going to completely control the internet. And there's actually a quote here where she's like, People think that it's their right to decide what goes on the internet. It's the government's, you know. What I mean, it's like really in your face. And they wanted to, they want to control uh, the whole right to forget thing. I think up to sixteen, wow, everything gets deleted. Huh? Whatever. It's like you know, it's like your uh, criminal record when you're a kid. It's like no, no, you can't see that. That they were a child when they murdered that person. And the a lot of the individual companies' rights to control what's on their site. No, not anymore. There's going to be government regulations for everything. So perhaps somebody that, you know, this is a local issue for can weigh in on this in the, in the comments. Oh, God, I'm inviting comments. Well, this, is, this is probably not going to end well. But I, this just seems so appallingly backward. Like, not, not just what they propose to do, but how they propose to do it. I mean, it just doesn't seem... It just does. It doesn't seem realistic. Is she pandering, and we just don't get it because there's a little bit of a cultural disconnect there, or does she actually believe what she is saying, which is perhaps the more dangerous situation? I wonder, is there a majority who is begging for this? That would be surprising. I mean, 
let's I would say older folks would go for this, right? <laughs> I'm afraid of but, the internet. Ah. But are older folks the people who are affected by this? I mean, are they making Facebook posts that they're really ashamed of and they're like, oh wow, I gotta get rid of that? How crazy would it be if, in fact, like you know, in the nursing homes over there, there's like you know, there's like cyber bullying going on and stuff like that. It's like, you know, Bob's no good at Canasta. Let's everybody make fun of Bob on Facebook because he can't do, you know, shuffleboard or Canasta or something. I know a lot of old people who are on Facebook. And it, we talked about, uh, I remember last week we talked about Amazon being the hot app and not Facebook. We had some teenage commenters who were like, listen, I'm a teenager. None of us use Facebook. That's, we don't touch it. What are you thinking? So uh, I guess we're too old to know that. And now I'm completely distracted thinking about, you know, cyberbullying and old people. <laughs> I've definitely known some crabby old people who were just, you know, <laughs> they were vicious and bitter. Did you eat those cookies that Margaret made? I wouldn't feed those to my dog. <laughs> or did I make that a public post? Well, Margaret should know. <laughs> Oops. Well, but in Europe, you just have that gotten rid of. No more. No more bullying. Oh, I think I just figured it out. Theresa May is herself the victim of such cyber bullying. Well, you know, she, I mean, can you imagine what she reads about herself online? <laughs> no one attends tea time at Theresa May's house. <laughs> Not ever. <laughs> well, Blackberry's working with automakers on an anti hack tool. So, this is like antivirus for your car? Yeah, so cars, car makers are preparing for the automation of cars. And some of them are actually going ahead and putting in systems. So like for the acceleration and the steering, we've talked about drive by wire before. They're just doing that already. It's like, okay, we have these systems, we're putting them in now because five years from now, we wanna be able to just be like, hey, our car can already do that. Just load the software hmm. and it's gonna be a self driver. It's worked out for Tesla. So you, the thing you have to think about with that though is you're loading like Android into your car <laughs> and stuff like that. And we've seen it. And Apple, yeah, Apple's going to have a car OS. It's a botnet. Yeah. So <laughs> when someone takes control of your car, the stakes are pretty high in terms of can they get to the steering system? And so BlackBerry has decided to try to get in on this. It's like, hey, we want to be the first one to get on the security of this. <laughs> It's not, it's not as crazy as it sounds. I mean, the first time I read this, and I was like, what, is, what does BlackBerry know? But BlackBerry actually has done a lot of work in security and app isolation, more in the context of like the Java virtual machine, because they were using that on their BlackBerry devices, like the phones and things like that. And so it may be that BlackBerry is looking to bring a, a secure OS like that to a platform like an automobile. Because you know, if you look at a BlackBerry phone, there's actually a little computer for the radio and then the, the actual handset computer. And uh, BlackBerry historically did really good compartmentalization of those devices, which is why BlackBerry devices were some of the first devices certified by the intelligence community for use by heads of state. And so maybe if they could bring some of that technology to the internet of things, it wouldn't be completely horrible. But I think all the engineers that worked on that at BlackBerry have probably already gone to work for other companies. The other thing is uh, software updates. So your car is going to need software updates. As these vulnerabilities are found, you're gonna to need to be updated. And right now, cars have a terrible system for that. Either you're paying these outrageous data fees because it's a car, or like my car's got the GPS. And sometimes I get a letter and it's like, hey, it's time to update the map and your GPS. Come down to the dealership and give us $100 and we'll do that. And it's like, $100? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think the roads are pretty much the way they were when you sold it to me. I don't need that update. So BlackBerry's looking at a way to safely update your car. And I'm sure there will never be a time where it gets stuck in an infinite update loop and your battery runs down. I don't know. It'd be really cool. It's like, I think I'd be really proud. It's like, my Tesla is a proud participant of the Mirai botnet. <laughs> 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 I'm driving, I'm at 65 miles an hour. I'm denying heat to someone in the Ukraine. <laughs> what a time to be alive when uh, my Minnesota mom's baby monitor can disable my heated seats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's going to be so many car accidents. I wonder if that will become like, there's going to be that first court case where somebody like really goes the extra mile to prove that it was hackers who caused him to crash <laughs> and thus he's not at fault. That's going to be like a major motion picture. Uh, we've already seen how that plays out in the courts and it was the Toyota sticky accelerator thing. It's going to play out exactly like that. Engineers yeah. are like, we can't replicate this. And it's like, well, I don't know what to tell you. 
<sighs> Next up, Facebook and Twitter are harming young people's mental health. <laughs> it's a good thing they're not using it. <laughs> <laughs> this this is based on the idea that as a young person, you should not constantly be focused on what other people have and how good their lives are when yours isn't that good. Which, now let's just extrapolate here. How do you think the advertising industry impacts <laughs> teens? How does the advertising industry work in general? <laughs> That's, you pretty much just described them. So maybe watching commercials ain't too good for the... Isn't, isn't, isn't that how we got women to smoke in the 1920s? Was yeah, like, they, you know, uh, independent women smoke. Well, that was the Bernays thing. He uh, <laughs> he hired the suffragettes to to smoke during the the marches and hold them up like the Statue of Liberty. They were like the the Liberty cigarettes. <laughs> and it worked. Huh. So this is just more of the same. So if we're gonna put a stop to it now, we should also put a stop to everything. Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, I I can't see a difference between you know Coke showing me beautiful people drinking Coke and laughing. Versus seeing beautiful people doing things on Facebook and making me feel bad about myself. But <laughs> is there really a... I guess I know the, these other people and it gets a little worse. So maybe the solution then is to just educate the populace on that type of messaging and psychological manipulation and give them the tools that they need to <laughs> rebuff that type of brainwashing. Uh, I don't really know. I don't think that's what Theresa May wants to do. <laughs> yeah, Theresa... You know, you know, in a lot of ways, what Theresa May wants to do is actually probably a worse situation because not being exposed to those kinds of things, you won't be able to deal with it as well when you're exposed to it through, you know, commercially valid means or through like an accepted ver like you're gonna be exposed to the same things. Yeah. Let's well, be clear about that. But worse for who? <laughs> I mean worse I for think the individual. I think for Theresa May and her <laughs> campaign donors, that's the perfect situation. <laughs> you think she realizes that on an intellectual no, lever, or is, it, is, is she not. just like these no. people can't make money if this? Doesn't well, happen. that's the old question: Is she stupid or is she evil? <laughs> I like to prefer to think she's stupid. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's the end of that kind of news. Let's talk about hardware. Uh, AMD had their event, which was surprisingly, you know, detail-filled. They haven't actually released anything yet, but they're doing this ahead of Computex because I think Intel has some has some announcements coming up at Computex from if the internet is to be believed. And, uh, you know, the first thing is AMD's Naples. Uh, is uh, They're, they're going to call it Epic. Another bad name. <laughs> oh, man. I, I you're, you're not, are you saying the CPU is not Epic? Because the CPU seems pretty Epic. Yeah, I think maybe not choose a word that's already been driven into a joke itself. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so overused to call things Epic. I, I could probably, like, I could do a recursive version of this so uh let's see uh epic performance yet cheaper <laughs> yeah, i don't know 16 to 32 cores there also is going to be an enthusiast part in this so i guess this is what they're calling like what they're calling naples or whatever they, they also mentioned threadripper um, which is a 16 core part that has more pci express lanes i guess and is different then the current Ryzen platform is maybe a little bit of higher, uh, a little bit of a higher end platform um, for CPU, so more cores. Uh, it looked like there was going to be 16 cores, 12 cores, 10 cores. So, uh, you know, Intel, I guess, is going to leapfrog with it was going to leapfrog the Ryzen 7, and so now it's like, well, AMD is like, well, you know, our server stuff's available on the desktop if you really want it, so we can go all the way up to 32 cores if you want. Yeah, they mentioned some uh, partnerships like Alienware, which makes it obvious that is going to be a desktop system because they don't do server stuff. <laughs> no. I think they've got to work on their clock speed. The 4.1 gigahertz top-end clock for AMD is problematic for things that are not multi-threaded. But for everything else that is multi-threaded, I mean, it's really, it's honestly kind of nuts. I don't think people realize how disruptive AMD can be in the server market either because... If you look at like the 22 core Xeon CPUs, um, the, the, what Intel has done with some of their higher core count CPUs is called a hidden NUMA node. And so what that means is it's basically like a dual socket CPU on a CPU. And so some of the cores on the CPU can't actually directly access memory or directly access peripherals or a combination. And they're just there for compute. So it's, it's super, super diminishing returns. Let's say that you're a you know, an ISP and you've got a web server or something like that, if you can service a web request 
in less time than it takes to load the request onto another CPU, have that CPU service it, and then get the, the process data back from that CPU, you've got a problem because you'll never fill the CPUs that are on that hidden NUMA node in the architecture. And that is a real problem right now on the, uh, in, in the, on the Intel Xeon platform. And if the press release is to be believed, that is going to be much less of a problem on AMD's platform. But we'll have to wait to Computex to see. And of course, last week we saw the i9 release and they were turboing to 4.5, 4.6. So of course we don't know pricing yet, but that does take a little bit of the wind out of their sails here because like you say, that clock speed does still disappoint. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I don't know that I would say it disappoints because it's still really fast. Like for all for it's it is not going to hamstrung the CPU, but it's the only thing preventing the CPU from being the winner in all scenarios. I think, or pretty much all scenarios, especially when you consider the higher end parts with more PCI Express lanes. Also, in the press release was Vega. Vega was kind of <laughs> weird though. Yeah, that, I would say that was a. They they I think they knew they had to say something. It's like we've we've teased this for too long. <laughs> we've got to give them something. What can we give them? <laughs> so this is going to be all about machine learning and business style workloads, and that kind of makes sense. Most people don't realize that Nvidia has an HBM2 product and has had the HBM2 product, I think, for over a year now. Uh, but it's I think it's about a six thousand dollar component, um, sixteen gigs of HBM2. It's in servers, shared GPU. So if you've got you know like an architecture firm and you've got a couple of virtual desktop servers for intellectual property protection, rather than having those, you know, um, those cards that'll do acceleration of your workloads that an architect would run, simulation, fluid dynamics, SolidWorks, CAD, those kinds of things, uh, is centralized on a server platform, VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, and HBM2 really is super awesome, great there. But, you know, HBM plagued with supply issues for the actual interposers and memory and, and that kind of thing. Well, HBM is sort of, at least that was the case when the Fury came out, but now we've got HBM2 and things are a little different. There are multiple suppliers. It's maybe a little different situation, but the first Vega product, at least the one they talked about in the press release, is not really for gamers. And that kind of makes sense because we've got to, the business people, honestly, is where the margin is. And they talked about that in the press release. They talked about how, you know, with Polaris, it's really only about a third of the market in terms of profitability. It's those higher end parts. If NVIDIA is selling a $6,000 card, that only has 16 gigs of memory, then yeah, you figure there's quite a profit margin on that. Um, there was also a Reddit AMA um, with Raja Koduri, which you should totally check out. And the there was a lot of good information in there. But the thing that I'll say is that he confirmed there's no SR IOV support for these Vega components. There is gonna be a server Vega component that supports SR IOV, but I was really hoping to see SR IOV on the desktop because SR IOV combined with something like cubes, or just any kind of OS containerization or, or game virtualization, I'm convinced that that is the future. I just don't know if it's gonna get here in a year or five years or 10 years. So with, the, so with the beans spilled on sort of the Frontier edition of RX Vega, some people pointed out and said, well, hey, wait a minute, if that's gonna be the machine learning edition and that's gonna be sort of the big dog, that doesn't look like that's gonna be that great for gaming. What about the gaming performance and the gaming parts? And so AMD had to do sort of a follow-up announcement after the fact it was like, well, we're going to have some Vega cards that are going to be faster than the Frontier Edition, maybe for gaming workloads. And this did not make any sense to me at all. Yeah, again, it seems like they had to, it, they teased too much. They had to give us something. But then it was sort of like they shot themselves in the foot because it wasn't <laughs> that impressive. And they talked about the HBM2. And, you know, people were like, well, are we going to get that on the <laughs> RX cards? And it was like, well, we'd love to give that to you on the RX cards, but it's real hard to get and it's real expensive. <laughs> so there's a lot of questions about that. Well, let me, let me clarify. If you're running a machine learning lab or at your university and you're looking at an affordable HBM2 card, uh, you, you probably aren't sleeping for three days. But if you're a gamer, you're like, RX Vega Frontier Edition, what now? And so this, this is, you know, dealing with that sort of hole in the foot. <laughs> Because the machine learning people are definitely super excited about Vega. The gaming people were like, well, wait, what about us? I think most of the people watching this are going to be the gaming people. <laughs> and so the answer is, we still don't know. It, you know, it's, it, it seems like maybe it'll be good, but it always seemed like that, right? <laughs> Rockstar Russia. <laughs> <Is that> just... 
He's just living it up, living the he's, dream. He's loving the attention. Maybe that's part of it. They're like, "Hey, Roger, we're gonna we're gonna finally release the details." He's like, "No, no, no, no. There's much more of this to milk." <laughs> he's gonna work it into a stand-up comedy routine. It'll be great. He's gonna hire some people for that. You just don't understand how it works. Now, last week we talked about Windows 10 S, and we said that anything in the Windows App Store would work on Windows 10 S. We were wrong. Yeah, this is a yeah. correction. And before that, we said that it was going to have Chrome and Firefox. <laughs> Wrong. So it turns out it's not going to have those. And now it's not going to run any of the Linux App Store content. Yeah, even though you have to get, at least for the, the initial installer you get from the store, Microsoft's taking the, the position of saying, well, we think the command prompt in general, PowerShell, and, and of course the Linux subsystem, is too much of a vector for malware. So that's totally not going to be supported on Windows 10 S. Yeah, it seems, I mean, they really want this to be locked down, and I don't think it's just for security. They're looking for that Apple way of life where they control everything, you pay for everything. Because if you think about it, once you get the, the Linux stuff, you can start to replace some of those apps that they're going to sell you, and a lot <laughs> of those subscriptions that they're going to sell you. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube download goes a long way on the command line for Linux. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Pretty soon, he won't even have an MP3 player that doesn't cost anything. <laughs> well, it's funny that you should mention that because MP3 is dead, but I'm still using it. Wait, wait, it's dead. It's just the patent has expired, so now MP3 <laughs> can be used everywhere. So there were some announcements in the good old mainstream media that MP3 was dead, and you shouldn't use it anymore because the patents have run out. But wait, what? It, <laughs> That's like, the, that's like the best time to be alive if you're a piece of software. <laughs> so MP3, of course, is used everywhere. And now you don't have to worry about patents. Anybody can use MP3 for any reason, and you should use it more than ever. Now, of course, they're trying to push you toward AAC and some other formats, which are still proprietary. But MP3 now, go crazy with it. Yay for patents expiring. Can you imagine if copyrights expired in the same way? How oh, much? I mean, 20 year old software. Who still uses 20 year old software? <laughs> There'd be blood in the streets. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's pure anarchy. We can't have it. Uh, well, switching news. If you live in America and you have a, a, an unmanned aerial vehicle, and I don't really want to call it a drone or a UAV or whatever. You no longer have to register with the FAA because apparently you had to register with the FAA previously. Yeah, this was kind of a silly rule and i guess they just you know they got to the point where they were like okay uh, let's get serious about this you can buy these at toy stores they're not that big of a threat so now you don't have to have your license <laughs> you know i've always wanted to build a set of iron man armor but um you know i don't think that there's any independent billionaires that are just sort of working <laughs> on that out there but companies are working on it to augment their, their warehouse staff. Well, so you could get a job at Lowe's, <laughs> but it's not quite Iron Man armor. <laughs> it's, really just, it's really just a bendy back brace. <laughs> so they call this an exoskeleton, which I guess technically it counts as that. But really what it does is when you hunch over to pick something up, you compress these, the springs in your back. And then when you pick it up, you get to return that energy. <laughs> it makes it easier to pick up. Neat. So, yeah, this is a super advanced back brace that Lowe's has spent a crazy amount of money working on, I guess. And they claim that uh, it's not uncomfortable to wear all day. So the employees like it. They don't complain about it. Now, there are other companies that are working on similar things. There's one company that has, like, an exoskeleton seat where you just sit down wherever you are and... The way the legs work, it's just like, okay, you're sitting down. Let me support you. Hmm. And there, I think there's a Japanese company that's working on uh, servos in the hand and the gloves that give you super grip. Hmm. Neat. Well, but there you go. now what that does, now we talk about the robots. This is not a robot by any means, but if you have your employees who can lift things easier and work harder because of that, that means less employees. <laughs> so you see what's happening here? Uh, I could just sling those 300-pound pallets around like Iron Man, and there doesn't need to be that many yeah. warehouse workers. Or you can hire from pools of, you know, like now now your female workers can do the same job as your male workers. So <laughs> Wait, I, what? That's sexist. Yeah. That, that was always the case. <laughs> I think. Well, okay. yeah. Wait. I don't know about if you know if you're carrying lumber at Lowe's <laughs> and you've got a 90 pound female, you do have to consider that in your hiring practices. No, that's offensive. I don't. I can't. <laughs> that's, I guess I'm the patriarchy. Uh, no.
Netflix has confirmed that it is now blocking rooted and unlocked devices on Android. Hmm. So this is not blocking. The, the headline was a little bit uh, outrageous there. So what's happening is if you have a rooted device or a custom firmware of any kind, it's not going to let you download the Netflix app from the Google Play Store. If you've already got it, it will work. It's not blocked. But Netflix is saying, yeah, this is right, but this is not a bug. We don't want rooted phones to access Netflix. I suspect this is probably content holders, like copyright holders, saying this is too much of a risk. You're putting our intellectual property at risk or whatever on Netflix's side because it seems really arbitrary and pedantic. Yeah. Uh, Maybe, you know, some kind of partnership where Google's like, well, we don't want to support these people, so, you know, we'll hook you up with some favored status if you don't let them use it in other news uh, the news of this story is not that robots could wipe out another six million retail jobs it is that cnn is covering an article that says <laughs> yeah. robots could wipe out another six million retail jobs this is also the video about the little orange robots <laughs> that uh, we didn't cover but they're hilarious because i think these robots are sorting mail <laughs> and they're doing it with all those little holes in the floor. So it's just like they know which hole to dump it in. And they stop for each other and they recharge themselves. And they're adorable. Look at them. That's the best part. This is a robot revolution I can get behind. It's like they're exterminating the human species, but they're so cute when they're doing it. <laughs> so, yeah, the sto- I mean, this is not news. We've talked about the robot revolution pretty much every week. But this is the mainstream sort of looking at it and being like, oh, hey, wait, six million jobs. <laughs> and they're talking about... It's it's not necessarily that, like we talked about the exoskeleton, it's not that all of a sudden you walk into Walmart and there's robots everywhere. It's happening in small ways that you can't really see and sometimes can't predict, but it does overall mean fewer and fewer people are needed. Yeah, this is also uh, an interesting perspective because this is sort of a more mainstream perspective. And so if you follow our content, this is not news to you. But if you read the article, the way that it is written, the language that they use, and how they characterize and talk about it is more interesting than the subject material itself. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, the people are seeing the light and it's burning their eyes. <laughs> and it's, it's almost too late to do anything about it because, you know, who saw it coming? <laughs> it's very meta. <laughs> Well, uh, we've got some a little bit of science news, kind of, sort of. There's this uh, exercise yeah. outfit, but it is alive. It's living. It is a living uh, exercise <laughs> suit, and it reacts to your the moisture that your skin's putting off. So this suit has a, a, a microbial ecosystem in it. I, I wonder if, can, did it mention if you could wash it? I didn't mention if he, I looked for that too. I was like, can you wash it? I mean, would they all die if yeah. you did it on like a hot dry or whatever? So these microbes react to humidity. So as you sweat and as your body becomes warmer from exercise, these microbes, for somehow they react and they open up parts of the outfit mm-hmm. to ventilate you. It makes it more breathable. It, it will wick heat away from your body is what it says. Now, I know that they make antimicrobial underwear <laughs> so if i put on antimicrobial underwear and then put this over top will there be a little war going on no i think i think there's a layer of insulation there so the microbes that live on your skin is bad but the microbes that you buy and live in your clothes are good what if i tear the clothes oh that's bad you shouldn't <laughs> <laughs> do not eat happy happy fun ball <laughs> i mean do you have to worry about because clothes will eventually become threadbare <laughs> There's a lot of questions about this. They did say, they did go out of their way to say that it was safe to eat these. So I guess. (laughs) (laughs) How would you like to be the guy? I was like, okay. All right, you signed these 500 waivers. We're going to need you to eat this outfit. (laughs) But not only that, it's kind of gross. I mean, you're you're literally eating an outfit that, you know, the biological material there has been built from your sweat. Hmm. (laughs) Still, though, it's really nice. They also mentioned that um, they could engineer the bacteria to glow when you're sweating as well. So I guess you could be your own nightlight if you're jogging at night or something like that. That'd be good so you don't get hit by cars. That would be kind of cool. Yeah. I I can't, I'm trying to think of ways that they would subvert that to control us. <laughs> I really I, I really feel like that this story is probably going to get more traction than it should just because it's got an attractive, you know, athletic female person in the picture in the thumbnail. And Cover- it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. And she's covered with microbes. <laughs> I feel, I've, I've got it. So if you have a job that's like manual labor, they're going to get these outfits and the color of your outfit shows them how hard you've been working. <laughs> I 
was like, Pedro, you're a green. <laughs> I've not been feeling well. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> Oh, and we've got a. We've got a <laughs> so I, I I had to include this one because I know that you're super excited about it. Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> Did everybody see the trailer for this? I feel like if we're going to talk about this trailer, we ought to at least talk about Seth MacFarlane's trailer for his vaguely Star Trek like thing. It's not really Star Trek at all. His thing is uh, Orville, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the the spaceship they gave to somebody after, I don't know. It's just it, they put Seth MacFarlane as Seth MacFarlane in charge of a spaceship in a Star Trek-like universe. So that seems infinitely more interesting, and it pains me so greatly to say that than this trailer. This trailer looks just terrible. We're not going to watch it. You can you can go watch it and use your imagination and come back, and then we can all commiserate together. Well, I think the high points are that we have uh, a captain that uh, doesn't seem like she's that strong character. <laughs> so I think she was crying in the trailer at some point. Uh, and then the Klingon. Generic <laughs> Klingons are generic space they're monsters. They're very, now. they're very much monsters in this one. That's, <laughs> I, I can. I, I bet there's going to be like episodes where she's in a dark, scary place, and the Klingons are either hunting her like alien, <laughs> alien with. Oh Jesus! I just <laughs> this this trailer. There's so much wrong with this trailer. This this is not like for anybody. This is not faithful to the Star Trek Enterprise. Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, franchise. This is not faithful to the Star Trek franchise, in my opinion, and I think Gene Roddenberry would be appalled. Yeah. Sorry. Seems like, uh, but hey, you know, it's a strong female protagonist, and it's very multicultural, so it's a new world. Got to roll with it. Neat. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Oh, this is the this is going to be online only, isn't it? There's some. Oh some, yeah, some yeah. Kind of I, I think I don't think it's going to run on. Uh, Traditional television, which at this point, like, what, <laughs> was the, what was the stats from the cord cutter thing from last week? Uh, it's five times higher than the yeah. previous record. So I don't think that Star Trek has a big following in the 65 plus demographic. So <laughs> it's probably fine. Oh, we had a couple corrections from last week. What were they? Uh, there was the, was, was last week the German? I don't remember. The renewable energy thing. A lot of people were like, oh, that's just one day. Well, we know that was in yeah. the story. It's <laughs> there were some people who were like that's not even true for one day, and it's like, well, it was true for one day. Maybe the maybe the industry was on holiday that day. I don't yeah. know. I, we we know that the German renewable picture is not as rosy as they make it out to be, but I think it still is like a global leader, right? Yeah. I mean, it's still an accomplishment, guys. Yeah. Come on, right. don't be so yeah. negative. <laughs> <laughs> There's enough negativity on the internet. If you're going to be negative, you at least have to sort of laugh at it and say, I'm going to laugh at this. This horrible situation, so we can move on. I think there might have been one other thing, but it, it was it was kind of picky. We've reached the end of the show where we're just rambling. We have no content, and really, honestly, this is probably... I mean, we already lost most of our viewers a long time ago, so they're never going to see this part anyway. So it's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's a short one this week, but we did have a ton of stuff to do today. So uh, we got to <laughs> get that content. Got to get it rolling. <laughs> so much content. Uh, should be good. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks to our patrons for making this available on a podcast. And thanks to everybody who's bought cool stuff in our store at store.level1text.com. I'm Wendell. I'm Ryan. And we'll be back next week. See ya.